physics department for this kind invitation to visit the department and deliver the lecture today and a couple of lectures tomorrow and the day after. As Swapna mentioned, this is the centenary year of Einstein's discovery of general theory of relativity and therefore this talk is to give a flavor of how Einstein came to the general theory of relativity. It will be at two different levels, a level which will be accessible to a starting student and some parts at the end may be a little more technical. We will see how things play out. So I begin with Einstein whose journey to general theory of relativity essentially happened from 1907 to 1915. In 1905 special relativity came into being and we know that it required the modification of Newtonian mechanics when the speeds of systems become comparable to the speed of light. If you looked at the equations of Maxwell's el uh, electromagnetism, they did not need to be changed. So the question obviously is, what about Newtonian gravitation? That had been a successful theory for almost about 200 years and was the basis for understanding everything which we knew about gravity and for example, for everything which we knew about the solar system. So to understand this particular difference between electromagnetism and Newtonian uh, gravitation, let us just compare at almost school level what is the difference and what is the similarity between these two forces. So it is almost something which, I, which you learn in school that electromagnetism, electrostatics is given by Coulomb's law, gravity is described by Newton's law of gravitation. This is an inverse square law. This is also an inverse square law. Electrostatic forces are determined by what we call electric charge. Similarly, it is the gravitational mass of a body which determines the gravitational force. When we look at charges in nature, there are two kinds of charges which we call positive and negative. But here we see there is a difference. There is only one kind of mass, one kind of gravitational mass. And therefore, in this particular case, you find the forces are both attractive and repulsive, like charges repel, unlike charges attract. But here, the force, though there is only one kind of mass, the force is always attractive. So like charges repel, as I mentioned, like charges, on the other hand, here attract. Now, when you start comparing the strength of these two forces, you find that the electromagnetic, the electrostatic force is much, much stronger and relative to the force of gravitation, 10 raised to 39 times stronger. If you try to screen an electrostatic force, you can do it because there are two kinds of charges, whereas because there is only one kind of mass, you cannot screen gravitation. If you look at the basic description of Coulomb's law and Newton's law, both can be said that they are instantaneous action at a distance. And then again you start noticing differences that if you look at moving charges, they produce not only electric fields but they produce magnetic fields. Whereas if you take a moving mass and a static mass, they produce the same gravitational field in Newtonian theory. These are described by Maxwell's equations and this is the famous inverse square law of Newtonian gravity. The equation of motion here is the Lorentz equation of motion. Here, of course, we have the equation of motion where the force term is the force term given by uh, Einstein, so Newton's theory of gravity. If you start looking at whether these uh, equations of Maxwell are invariant under the transformations which you discovered under special relativity, the answer is yes, they are invariant. But of course, here, since you do not have an analogous system of equations, it is not consistent with the principle of special relativity. The sources are charges and currents and here as I emphasize the sources are rest mass. So if you look at this particular list, it is clear that some things are similar but there are some things which are different between these two forces. And therefore, special relativity implies, okay, the other thing is that when you accept special theory of relativity, it says that you cannot have infinite speeds, there is a maximum speed for any interaction 
but because Newtonian gravity is action at a distance, the gravity is propagating almost instantaneously. So, if you have a source of Newtonian gravity, then as I said it is the rest mass of the particular body, but if you believe in special theory of relativity, mass and energy are equivalent and therefore, it really is artificial that once you believe in special theory of relativity, only one form of energy which is the rest mass has a gravitational uh, interaction. Then is a very important point which is the clue to whatever I am going to talk about later and this is the key experimental fact which goes back to Galileo which basically says that if you take bodies they fall with the same acceleration if you have a uniform gravitational field irrespective of whether you are dropping a gold, you are dropping a feather or you are dropping a lead ball. This is an important fact that today we know that it is a experimental fact which has been tested. For example, modern experiments tell that the moon and the earth fall towards the sun with an accuracy of about 10 raise to minus 13. So, therefore, the, uni the universality of free fall in a constant gravitational field is an experimental fact which we know about gravity. Now, Einstein, this is a experimental fact which goes back to Galileo because Galileo's experiment of, uh, of from the Pisa tower which is supposed to be an apocryphal story is uh, really verify that experiment. Newton himself tried to verify this particular experiment by using uh, pendulums and Einstein basically said that this important feature about gravity is very, very remarkable, but when you take into account Newton's theory of gravity. In this theory, it is a mere coincidence, it has no fundamental role in Newton's theory of gravity. And then comes the basic input which was the starting point for Einstein and it should be emphasized to students that when you want to do something big, it is not only important to find the right answer, but it is important to ask the right question. And this right question is what Einstein called his happiest, happiest thought in his life and this is what as I will argue led to the general theory of relativity. I am just quoting him directly, he basically said, then occurred to me the happiest thought of my life in the following form, the gravitational field has only a relative existence because for an observer falling freely from the roof of a house, there exists at least in its immediate surroundings no gravitational field. If the observer drops some bodies, these remain relative to him in a state of rest or uniform motion, independent of their chemical or physical nature, ignoring air resistance. The observer has the right to interpret his state as at rest. So, the important point is that this essentially was Einstein's lodestone. Because the university of, if you examine the universality of free fall, it really reveals an amazing coincidence between two very, very unrelated concepts, the concept of inertial mass and the notion of gravitational mass. Let me explain. When you look at Newton's second law, there is a mass which appears on the right hand side of the equation, which is a measure of inertia. And if you look at Newton's law of motion, there is a mass which appears here which measures, which is the analog of electric charge. So, I can call it the gravitational charge. So, there is a inertial mass, there is a gravitational mass and if you actually do experiments, one finds that the ratio of these two is a constant for all bodies and this as I emphasize is unexplained in Newton's theory. Einstein was convinced that is this coincidence was a vital clue and the most important fundamental fact about gravitation and it held the key to what the nature of gravitation was. And the important point is that though it took him almost 8 years to come to the general theory of relativity, he was he stuck to this particular uh, conviction all through. And as I will argue, there were many things which he gave up in between, but this experimental fact he hung on to and that is the key to his discovery of the general theory of relativity.
So, in some sense we can say that the first step in the formulation of general theory of relativity is what we will call as the equivalence principle. Now, what is the equivalence principle? The statement is that if you have a gravitational field by falling freely you can eliminate that gravitational field. On the other hand you can mimic a gravitational field in empty in free space or in far away uh, from all bodies by going to an accelerated frame. And the important point is that by a mechanical experiment you cannot distinguish between these two. So, what it means is Einstein generalized this idea from a mechanical experiment to all laws of physics and basically said that if you make experiments in a small folly, freely falling lab over sufficiently small times you cannot distinguish and from those experiments you cannot say whether you are in a inertial frame in free space or you are in uh, you know in a gravitational field which is falling uh, falling you know in a in the gravitational field. So, his equivalence principle is the idea that no experiment in physics can distinguish uniform acceleration from a uniform gravitational field. So, it essentially goes back to something which we have as a simple problem in 12th standard. So, for example, suppose I have a lift in which I have put a spring balance and attach a body to it and suppose it is sitting on the earth and then I compare it with another situation where I have this lift in empty in far away space and I accelerate it by minus g. So, the important point is that the spring will extend exactly by the same amount. So, if you are confined to the lift you cannot distinguish between this situation and this particular situation. Similarly, if you have a lift which is in free space and in this particular case you have a lift which is freely falling again you can cannot distinguish between these two. So, this is some simple problem which we do in 12th standard, but the important point is it has in it the kind of uh, you know insight which underlie what we think is the important point in Einstein's general theory of relativity. So, it looks like a very elementary fact, but the important point is from this mechanical situation Einstein generalized it. Remember when he did special relativity he did exactly the same thing. Instead of saying that you cannot distinguish by mechanical experiments whether you are in one inertial frame or another inertial frame, his, but his principle of relativity was you do any experiment in physics you cannot distinguish between a frame at rest and a frame uniformly moving. Here he is saying exactly the same thing that no physics experiment can distinguish between this situation and this situation or this situation and this situation. So, this is the physical insight. So, if the constancy of the speed of light is the physical input from nature into the construction of special theory of relativity, it is the equivalence principle which is the physical principle underlying the general theory of relativity. Now, once he understood this, he basically started doing his famous thought experiments, so that he could go from accelerated frames to what should happen in a general gravitational field. So, for example, he said let us look at what happens to a light ray if you look at it from an accelerated frame of reference. So, if you do the simple problem from mechanics you will see that light which is propagating in a straight line in a inertial frame will go in a curved path if you look at it from an accelerated frame. According to Einstein the accelerated frame is equivalent to a gravitational field. So, he concluded that in a gravitational field the path of a light ray must be you know bent must be curved. And this fact in 1911 itself he predicted and he said that well this is an important fact which uh, my theory of gravity will a new theory of gravity will predict and it is a fact which can be tested by experiment. And he said that you can test it by observing starlight which is passing close to the sun and an experiment was indeed uh, uh, planned in 1914, but because of the world war coming this experiment really was aborted and it is only in 1919 a British team under Arthur Eddington really verified this particular experiment and actually made Einstein the icon which he is today. The other thing is let us look at the speed of light. 
If you look at the speed of light as measured by an accelerated observer, again a simple mechanical calculation you will find that it is not a constant and therefore again if you say that this is exactly what will happen in a gravitational field, it will mean that the speed of light will be affected by gravity. Then from these experiments he went to what is called as the application of what happens when you look at a rotating frame of reference. And this is again supposed to be an important link in the history of general theory of relativity because if you take a rotating disk and start measuring its circumference and its radius by an experiment because if you put a rod across the uh, circumference because it has a certain velocity there will be length contraction whereas a rod across the radius will not have that contraction. So, if you take the ratio of circumference to uh, diameter it will be different from pi. Again this is an experiment in an accelerated frame, but according to Einstein in a gravitational field the analog of this should happen. I should sort of warn you that this is sort of a very loose kind of argument if you really start examining this more critically there are subtleties uh, uh, related to this, but it does figure in Einstein's way of thinking about it that is the reason I sort of mention it. So, the moment you start putting together what happens in an accelerated frame or and compare it to what happens in the uh, gravitational field slowly you realize that the possibility that you are not in the Minkowski space time of special theory of relativity, but in a geometry different from that immediately sort of emerges and this is why Einstein basically started going towards looking at a formulation of general theory of uh, a formulation of a gravitation theory where the curved space becomes an important ingredient of all this all what he does. In 1913 Planck visited Einstein in Zurich and Einstein told him that he was working on a theory of gravity and he was trying to run his ideas through him and Einstein and Planck is supposed to have told him as an older friend I must advise you against it for in the first place you will not succeed and even if you succeed nobody will believe you. So, Einstein's idea at that particular time of trying to view gravity as geometry was something which even a scientist like Planck thought would not sort of succeed. So, if you really look at what were the important steps and according to Einstein himself when he was looking at what happened in that in 1907 the basic idea for the general theory of relativity came with the formulation of the equivalence principle. And then you realize that he worked very much like what he did in special theory of relativity. Remember if you look at the paper on the electrodynamics of moving bodies in that particular paper the he begins by trying to say that the electric field and the magnetic field should be combined into one electromagnetic field because it is only relative motion which has meaning not independently the electric and magnetic uh, field. Similarly, once you believed that you went through all of special relativity and then you realize that space and time needed to be combined and therefore, space time is the only thing which has an independent existence uh, in you know uh, as uh, rather than independent existence for space and time by themselves. So, in general theory of relativity what he basically is doing is he is comparing he is combining the gravitational field and space time into one structure and we can describe it as an inertial gravitational field. Whether something is accelerated frame or whether it is a gravitational field depends on the state of motion of the observer. Just as here whether you have an electric field or a magnetic field depends on the state of motion of the observer. Here one is saying depending on whether it is the accelerated motion or not, whether it is uh, something because of uh, the pseudo force related to the acceleration or whether it is a real gravitational field, you cannot really uh, separate them. A combination of them is what has meaning in general. By 1912 as I said, he started realizing that the non Euclidean nature of this metric which is there was important ingredient and then he realized that to describe it he would try to use 
a second rank tensor in this four dimensional space time which is already existing and this pseudo metric of space time would be the basic description of the gravitational field. So, if you really think you can say that the inside that space time and gravity should be represented by the same structure this was the most enduring legacy one can say of Einstein and in 1915 as I will go through in the later slides he basically came to the field uh, here equations of gravitation and with this he could explain something which was an outstanding problem for almost many uh, decades. So, essentially you can see that there were sort of these four steps and each of them had a, a kind of basic input coming into his particular theory. Now, because this is the centenary year Einstein's discovery of the general theory of relativity has been studied more critically by historians of science and therefore, the important point is that we have this general feeling that Einstein was a genius he just locked himself in his in a room and discovered the general theory of relativity all by himself just by his imagination. The historians of science two well known historians of science uh, Michael Janssen and Jürgen Ren basically looked at Einstein's notebooks over this particular period and have provided recently in a series of articles their reconstruction of what happened during this important years and it is very interesting and this article really appeared in physics uh, today which is basically called the arch and the scaffold. So, we see the arch of Einstein's theory it is supposed to be a magnificent cathedral. What these people argue is that it was built on a scaffold of other things which happened earlier and it is not that essentially in 1915 Einstein really had the insight to come to what we call the general theory of relativity in its final form. So, the story really begins as I said in 1913 where Einstein looking at an elaborate analogy between the gravitational and the electromagnetic fields produced in collaboration with his friend Marcel Grossman an earlier theory which which was called Entwurf field equations. Entwurf I understand is the German word for outline or draw or draft theory. So, this is a theory which they came up with. Now, the limitation of this particular theory was that it was not a generally covariant theory which he also wanted to ha have. It only had limited covariance, but Einstein was such a genius that whenever he wanted something he would always find an argument to justify it. So, he is supposed to have justified the limited co covariance by giving some argument which is a technical argument called a whole argument which later on again can be proved to be a wrong thing. So, one again has to keep in mind that it is not that Einstein was always right as I will show Einstein made a lot of algebraic mistakes when he did calculations. Einstein made conceptual uh, mistakes where you know when he went along in his discovery of the general theory of relativity, but there was something special about him which also these people sort of discuss which I will sort of come to and which essentially is the moral of all this historical studies. Then what he does is with Grossman he in, uh, finds out the field equations from this particular theory. So, first he writes down a uh, field equation it has only limited covariance then he tries to write down a variational principle from which these equations can be obtained basically because once you have a variational principle you have to deal with only one particular quantity rather than a bunch of uh, you know tensorial quantities. So, it is easy to understand issues of covariance of this Lagrangian rather than looking at the components of the gravitational field. So, he does this for these wrong equations and if you look at the structure of the Lagrangian it is very similar to the Lagrangian for the electromagnetic uh, field and therefore, it is like the square of the field and the gravitational field itself is written as the gradient of the metric which acts as the potential. So, he tries the to take the analogy from electromagnetic equations and take takes it over to the gravitational case and writes down very you know what the equation should be. Then 
you know, he sort of notices that you need, if you want to have energy momentum conservation, then you need to put conditions on this particular metric and therefore it defines the class of transformations under which this Lagrangian will retain its particular form. So again you can see that Noether theorem is still not happened. So within this particular theory Einstein really has already started trying to investigate the relationship between symmetries and conservation. So this work is there in Einstein's work. He had this particular theory and then Einstein realizes that you have to have some experimental verification of these equations. Only then you can go forward. So with his friend Besso, he addresses this problem of the perihelion of Mercury. I will come to that in more detail a little later. And he found that when he did that, whatever he had to uh, verify does not really come out from these particular equations. He had to find out some deficiency of about 43 seconds of arc per century. This theory only gave 18 seconds of arc per century. So he realizes that these equations are not sort of good enough. But then these people also do something else. As I said, since he believed there is an equivalence between the gravitational field and the accelerated frames, he tries to check whether the rotating disk was a solution of these particular equations. And then he finds that it is the, the, it does satisfy these equations, so he is happy. But then later on, one, uh, one uh, knows that there was a mistake in his calculation. So he believed that this is the equivalence principle is well satisfied by these equations, but that is because of an algebraic mistake he makes. Then he goes to 1914, where he is writing a review of uh, the general the theory of relativity and then he starts from this Lagrangian. He does not specify what this Lagrangian should depend on in explicitly, but says that it should depend on the metric and its derivatives, sets up con uh, conditions which will determine the covariance of the Lagrangian so that energy momentum conservation will happen and then says that if you want energy momentum conservations, then the covariance of these field equations will have to be restricted. So he tries to apply something physical and then tries to say something, tries to justify the limited covariance which his equations has. In 1915 he goes back to his old calculations with Besso and then discovers that the rotation metric is not a solution of this earlier theory. So the moment he realizes that, he realizes that that is not a good starting point and therefore he should try to go back to the Lagrangian and modify this Lagrangian keeping this general formalism but modify the Lagrangian from the end to our uh, Lagrangian to something else. So he wants to do this. Now how does he do that? You basically have to change the definition of the gravitational field because originally he had defined the gravitational field in a particular way. So he realizes that if you can change the definition of the gravitational field and not just think of it as the derivative of the metric, but define the gravitational field in terms of Christoffel symbols, which we know is the right object to, if you, are, if you know differential geometry, this is essentially the, was the key to the solution which you have. And then we realize that like all of us today, Einstein was also insecure because he realizes that Hilbert was also working on this particular problem. And therefore, on consecutive Thursdays of November 2015, on 4th, 11th, 18th and 25th, he writes four short papers trying to come to his theory of gravity. And what these historians basically argue is that in the previous transparency I told you that he has already set up a framework around the field equations of a wrong theory and it is this which he uses as a framework or a scaffold on which he now puts new arc stones by which he can construct his new field. So the structure remains the same, but the ingredients by which, which are put on that particular structure to make the cathedral, they are sort of replaced. Instead of looking at the derivative of the metric, he is going to describe the gravitational field in terms of these Christopher symbols. <coughs> 
and what they argue is that if you go through his particular argument uh, uh, go through whatever he did in these four papers this is essentially what he he has basically done so now they basically go over the four papers which he wrote in this particular uh, year in this particular month rather so first as i said he realized this equation is not the correct equation and therefore he says that well maybe i i was wrong in trying to look for a form which is only invariant under a limited class so let me try to use a broader class of coordinate transformations and write a more general set of equations so he replaces these field equations by another set of equations then what he does is so then he changes it so that the equations are more generally covariant but then he realizes that he has to put some limitation on the nature of matter which enters these equations so you can see that it is not that you know he is imagined the final structure and got the answer he is really tinkering he has got a basic princi physical principle by which he started and then he is writing equations and then he has these twin requirements one thing is he wants to have general covariance and on the other hand he wants to describe matter by energy momentum tensor so that the conservation of energy momentum will follow automatically from these equations then what he does is he said well he has this uh, 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 slightly modified set of, set of equations and then again he says okay let me try to see if i calculate something physical what happens and then immediately he discovers that whatever he wants to predict really will come out of these new equations so again you can see that he could do this very quickly because in 1913 with besso he had already done that calculation for a wrong theory and then finally here he was not very happy that because his equations were putting limitations on the nature of matter so in the last case he basically says that well i should not do this let me change my equations in a different way so that these equations don't put a restriction on the nature of matter and when he does that he finally obtains what we call today as the einstein equations i'm not really writing equations i'm just describing it qualitatively so that it is more uh, accessible but after the lecture if somebody is interested we can look at now if you look at what really happened over these last many years 8 years basically if you try to understand what happened is today we know that whenever you have a system of equations to really find specific solutions we can choose specific coordinate, coordinate uh, specific gauges that is essentially what we call coordinate conditions einstein really didn't understand this notion of coordinate conditions so what you would realize is that he would basically try to put coordinate restrictions and therefore the equations which he generated really were not general enough because they had inbuilt in them these restrictions which really came from the coordinates which he was sort of choosing and the other thing is that as i said you know he was looking for covariance and the energy momentum conservation by the end of it you realize that instead of conservation restricting the covariance he basically comes to the situation which we believe today that if the equations are covariant then they will guarantee conservation and that is exactly how we teach general theory of relativity and if you ask what he did actually in this fourth thing he added a trace term in the energy momentum tensor and these people say that you know whenever you have a huge arc you know you try to build this particular arc but then there is one particular small gap which is there where you put a keystone which really makes it very stable so these historians basically say that this trace term was really the keystone of this magnificent arch which we call einstein's equations which is today so basically therefore as i want to sort of emphasize if you really go through the technical things at some particular stages he realizes that you know uh, whatever geometry was already existing you know his his mathematical friend grausman really told him about the tensor analysis work of riemann christoffel ricci lebesgue etc and it is really putting all these together with his help which really led him to the general theory of relativity so we can say that arbitrary gravitational fields are described by four dimensional but curved space time 
and space time is determined by the matter and energy content this essentially is what we call Einstein's equations. So, we can say that Albert Einstein completed the general theory of relativity on 25th November 1915 and his first expose the foundation of the general theory of relativity was published in 1916. General theory of relativity is the best description of gravitation because it unifies special relativity and Newton's law of universal gravitation and describes gravity as a geometric property of space time. The curvature of space time is directly related to the energy momentum tensor of whatever matter and radiation are present and this relation is specified by Einstein's field equations and mathematically it is a complicated theory because it is a system of nonlinear partial differential equations. In the big book called Mishnah, Thorn and Wheeler they describe Einstein's equation very pictorially they basically say that it is matter which tells space time how to curve and it is space time which tells matter how to move. So, this is a picture which you always see of Einstein's uh, general theory of relativity which basically says that in Einstein's view geometry is encoded gravity is encoded in space time geometry a mathematician knows that space time geometry invariantly can be described by curvature. So, a tensor which is uh, constructed from the curvature basically is the, the equation which describes the gravitational field as far as Einstein is concerned. Now, you may ask this particular question that if the gravitational field can be transformed away why are there tides on the earth and you should sort of realize that the important point I have been sort of stressing is a uniform gravitational field can be transformed away over a small region on the earth the acceleration due to gravity will be a constant. So, you can go to a frame falling with that same acceleration and that gravitational field will be transformed away. But suppose you really take a real gravitational field. So, what is shown here is the earth and there is a real gravitational field and in this gravitational field two bodies are falling towards the earth. Now, suppose you measure the separation between these two bodies and because they are in a real gravitational field this object will be accelerated more because the force is more on this. So, obviously after some time if you monitor this distance this distance will increase. Why is this distance increasing because the gravitational field is not constant it changes. So, it is this non uniformity of the real gravitational field which is called the tidal field which really is the true gravitational field. There is a small part of the gravitational field which can be transformed away by going to an accelerated frame, but not all the part of the gravitational field can be transformed away. Similarly, if you put two bodies horizontally separated both of them will fall towards the center of the earth and therefore, again the separation will change. So, this is what a physicist will say that a tidal force the force on this body and this particular body is sort of uniform, but if you sense it over a large distance there is a difference in that particular force. What you sense is the derivative of the gravitational field the derivative of the gravitational field is the tidal field and that is exactly what you measure of measure. So, the tidal gravitational field cannot be transformed away and this represents the physical effect of gravitational fields. Translated to mathematics you know that you have the metric and then you from the metric you construct the derivatives of the metric and if you try to look at how many derivatives of the metric independently exist you find that a certain number of them can be transformed away by going to a arbitrary frame, but where there are certain number of those derivatives which cannot be transformed away and that is what measures the curvature and that curvature is what is measured by this tidal field. So, if you want to translate a mathematical description to a physical description one can say that the equation of geodesic deviation where the Riemann tensor appears gives the tidal force which is acting on this particular system and therefore, you can go between the mathematical description in terms of curved geometry and the physical descrip description in terms of tidal fields. So, after he writes this particular paper he writes to Sommerfeld during the last month I experienced one of the most exciting uh, 
and most exacting times of my life true enough also one of the most successful now the marvelous thing which i experienced was the fact that not only did newton's theory result as a first approximation but also the perihelion of mercury which is 43 seconds per hour century as a second approximation so let me ex explain this because this is the most exciting prediction which happened now when you learn newtonian mechanics and you consider the inverse square law from goldstein you basically know that if you have an inverse square law and if you have a particle moving in their particular potential it will move in conic sections so that's how we know that planets will move in elliptical orbits but if you really look at the orbit of mercury it is not a elliptical orbit it is actually a rosette now why is it a rosette it's a rosette basically because the sun and the mercury are not the only two bodies in the universe in the solar system there are other planets so the other planets have gravitational effects on mercury and therefore the perihelion of mercury will not come back to the same point but it will sort of keep sort of drifting and this is what is called as the precession of the perihelion of mercury so i have just shown this here that this is the mercury this is the sun so the perihelion keeps sort of shifting now astronomers had studied mercury vernier for example in 1843 1859 realized that there is a motion there is a problem when you looked at this uh, mercury's motion because as i said this we understand you can measure how much their precession is per century remember astronomers could be confident that their measurements of planetary orbits were good enough and this was the number which they had based on their observations by using celestial mechanics calculations you can cal calculate how much venus contributes how much jupiter contributes how much the earth contributes and how much the rest of the uh, planet should contribute and it adds up not to 574 but to 531 seconds of arc remember this is 531 seconds per arc so 43 seconds of arc is missing but remember this is 43 seconds of arc per century in 100 years now you would say that maybe there is a mistake in my observations but the astronomers were confident the people you know expert the mathematicians beginning with gauss who really did all these calculations were sure that their way of calculating it was also correct so people knew that there was something which was missing and other people like verrier basically said that maybe there is a planet between mercury and the sun which we are not seeing which is contributing this extra 43 seconds of arc people astronomers tried to look for it but could not find it and einstein's theory where you start with newton's theory at the lowest order but when you go beyond the lowest order like in special theory of relativity there are relativistic corrections so the, there are v square by c square corrections to newtonian orbit equations and that really gives you this 43 seconds of arc this was the amazing success which einstein himself discovered and as you can see therefore again this is something which is characteristic of einstein that not only he makes a theory which looks very abstruse he tries to calculate something physical and it explains something which is outstanding which he did not start out to explain he didn't start out to explain this he came up with the theory and that theory naturally led to this particular explanation you may think that general theory of relativity is a useless theory because you know a few people can get jobs and that's the reason they keep doing it they can find out exact solutions so they can do it in it but i will try to argue that every one of you today who uses a smartphone in which there is a gps really have to say thank you to einstein because if you look at the global positioning system what is it that you really do around the earth there are a large number of satellites which are sort of going in some various orbits so there are 24 orbit satellites in different orbits they carry very precise clocks atomic clocks by which time can be sort of measured and they try to compare time with a clock which is sitting on the earth now if you want to have a good gps you should really have good clocks which we know exist because atomic clocks are good but the important point is 
that in addition to having these clocks which are synchronized and running at well calibrated rates, you really have to take into account the fact that the clock ups is moving at some speed. So, there is a special relativity corrections in that particular clock. It is in a different gravitational field. So, there is a general relativity correction there. So, you basically find that there is a correction which is which you have to really make from general theory of relativity and unless you do this correction almost in a few minutes the GPS would be totally useless. So, the GPS has inbuilt in it the corrections which come from special theory of relativity and the general theory of relativity and therefore, you can see that it has already started affecting the something a kind of device which every one of us basically uses and we may not find it very important, but you know that things like aeroplanes, spacecrafts and so on. Just imagine when you have to deal with large distances, the accuracy has to be more and more. So, if you want to launch a Mars orbiter which has to go to Mars, if your time keeping is not very good, obviously instead of going to Mars it would go somewhere else. So, obviously time keeping is the key and time keeping really cannot happen unless you take into account the effects of special theory of relativity and the general theory of relativity. So, find it very interesting when you look at the beginnings of special theory of relativity, you always talk about synchronizing of clocks. Now, one may think if you really look at it that it is something only a thought experiment which Einstein is doing, but if you really look at people like Poincare who really were people who were appointed by the Bureau of Longitudes to make maps to do to sort of uh, develop times, uh, time standards and so on, you basically realize that there is actually a practical problem. If a train went from Germany to France and then it was calibrated to a local time, obviously chances of a collision would obviously be more. So, you really needed to transfer time from one place to another. It was this practical requirement of time transfer which really began all this exercise of trying to you know set up time standards by sending up signals etcetera etcetera. So, it begins from time transfer for some practical railroads or for building maps for surveyors and so on. This really led to the abstract thought experiment of Einstein and then you realize that he comes up with a theory and that theory now is really used for transferring time which you use for aviation and for space travel. So, this is how basically science sort of basically fundamental science proceeds. It comes from a low precision experiment, but then comes up with a prediction which can be verified with a higher level of precision and then you go to the next level and so on. So, now let us ask once Einstein has got his theory of general theory of relativity, is the situation better when you make a comparison between electromagnetism and not Newtonian gravity, but the general theory of relativity. And then you realize that just as these were given by Maxwell's equations, these are given by Einstein's equations. Maxwell's equations do not contain the equation of motion. You have to specify the equation of motion, the Lorentz equation of motion independently to complete the system of equations. Einstein's equations contain their equation of motion and this is interesting basically because Einstein's theory is a nonlinear theory and therefore, as I said the covariance of this particular theory uh, ensures energy momentum conservation and from that equation itself you can derive the equation of motion. Again the technical development of the Einstein equa the equations of motion goes back to the work of Einstein, Infeld and Hoffman, but basically the important point is you do not have to specify the equation of motion independently. Einstein's equations contain the equation of motion themselves. Here it is invariant on the special theory of relativity here it is invariant on the special theory of relativity, but only in the local inertial frame. Why is that? Because it is only in the local frame that you can do away with gravity. You cannot do away with gravity all along. So, in a small region you can do away with gravity. So, special relativity must be true. What are the sources here? The sources as I told you are charges and currents. And now, instead of only the mass being the source of gravity, if an object is moving that also is a source of gravity. If an object has stress, even that is a source of gravity. So, the source of gravity in general theory of relativity is the energy momentum tensor. Here you have the basic Coulomb field 
and the analog loosely of the coulomb field i can say is some approximation of the, what we call as the schwarzschild solution now the picture which we have once you accept special theory of relativity is that there is something called an electromagnetic field but the electric field and the magnetic field which an observer measures really is given only if you know the whirl line of the particular observer by projecting something relative to the whirl line of an observer you will find out the electric field which he will measure or she will measure and the magnetic field which he or she will measure the same thing happens in einstein's theory there is a general description of the gravitational field but what is what you would call as the electric field measured by an observer will depend on the whirl line of the particular observer and that is what we call as the gravity electric field and similarly the important point is just as you have magnetism you have the analog of the magnetism in the gravitational case and this is what is called as gravity magnetism we can go beyond the leading in the electric case just as you have a dirac monopole solution in in uh, electromagnetism if you if you extend um, maxwell's equations by monopole uh, sources you have exactly the analog of a monopole like solution in einstein's theory also which is called as the nut solution what i'll talk to tomorrow is the other prediction of einstein which goes back again to maxwell maxwell basically said that if you have accelerated motion there is a prediction of electromagnetic waves in einstein's theory similarly einstein predicted that there should be gravitational waves and since i'm going to talk about it in detail tomorrow i will just skip there a couple of technical things the differences between electromagnetism and gravity usually can be traced to the fact that if you make a field theory description electromagnetism can be described by a massless spin one field whereas general relativity is described by a massless tensor spin two field the biggest challenge of course as many of you know is that not only do we have a classical theory of electromagnetism we have a quantum theory which is the quantum electrodynamics which underlies all the things which we know about you know very delicate things which happen and because of the quantum effects of electromagnetism unfortunately there is no quantum theory of gravity yet and therefore the situation here is much much uh, open so coming back to what i said in my uh, title in 1905 his insight not only resolved conflicts between mechanics and electromagnetism but brought about a resolution a kind of revolution because it replaced absolute space and absolute time which was which is which underlies newton's mechanics by this notion of space time and space time really became an arena on stage on which interactions and particles perform like actors and play out their tale all the physics which we learn are the act, the acting or the plays which particles and interactions dole out when they act on a stage which is the minkowski space time special relativity as we know is one of the two pillars of all physics and of course the other pillars is quantum mechanics and when you put them together you get quantum field theory which is which underlies our understanding of nature today but in 1915 einstein makes an inspired leap and proposed the general theory of relativity and created a even more drastic revolution because in the general theory of relativity the geometry of space time is distorted or curved and this distortion encodes the gravitational field so what happens is that space time is not just an actor or, or is not just a background stage but becomes like an actor itself and therefore you find that you know matter you know space time not only acts on matter matter acts on space time and you really don't know whether gravity you know whether the background is the stage or whether it is an actor and this difference or this complication is in some sense something which is not resolved till today and which is one of the reasons why we don't have a quantum theory of gravity because there are two different ways in which uh, 
the quantum theory of gravity is perceived. One where you think of gravity as a field like the electroweak field or the quant uh, uh, like the electromagnetic field propagating on a flat space time. But according to the, gen the people who believe in general theory of relativity, this is not a good thing to do. And therefore, whether one view or the other finally is the correct theory is not something on which we have the final answer till today. I said that there are many things which Einstein tinkered with, but why is it that he succeeded? And this is really uh, the, again as I said the historian of science. The important point he makes is that Einstein had lofty philosophical goals, but he never lost sight of the more mundane problems on how to reconcile the basic insight of equivalence principle and its intimate connection to iner inertia and gravity with the results of special theory of relativity. This as I said was the lodestone which he always kept in mind. Then he not only uh, relied on philosophical ideas, but really uh, you know, used the elaborate analogy be between electromagnetism and gravitational field and tried to construct his theory in analogy with that in the beginning. Einstein was very stubborn as I told you he tried to justify any time he wanted to you know use something he would come up with an ingenious argument to justify it many times they were wrong. So though he was stubborn he showed remarkable flexibility at several key junctures where philosophical you know uh, compulsions led to a clash with sound physical principles like conservation of energy and momentum. He always checked that philosophical goals would be realized in a physically sensible theory. So the important point is that he did all this then you may ask you know was it necessary at all that he had these philosophical objectives. So the historian says it is very interesting that that was very important too because most of the other physicists only tried to make consistency between special relativity and Newton's theory of gravity. They never realized that there was a fundamental fact about gravity which was different the equivalence principle. Einstein was the only person who all through said that the equivalence principle is a fundamental physical insight into the nature of gravity and if a theory of gravity does not incorporate that, that theory of gravity is incomplete. So therefore of course the fact that he had this philosophical uh, insight was really important in getting to the general theory of relativity itself. Has general theory of relativity any impact beyond what happened in the beginning? Of course the answer is yes it has had a very deep impact because as Einstein himself sort of realized general relativity can be applied to universe as a whole. If you ask me what was very important about Newton was that he showed that his theory of gravity applied to uh, apple falling on the earth and to a planet moving in a solar system. But if you try to apply Newton's theory of gravity to all the matter in the universe you find that it would not really it is not very easy to sort of apply it consistently you can do it you can have Newtonian cosmology but you have to look at insights coming from special theory of relativity. But Einstein immediately realized that his general theory of relativity could be applied to the universe as a whole and then basically whatever we know about cosmology today which was vindicated when the CMB was discovered and whatever we know about modern cosmology which has statements about what is the origin, what is the evolution, what is the end of the universe, experiments which have verified all that really starts from what happens in general theory of relativity. When you look at stars for example, with Chandrasekhar we knew that there were white dwarfs. But then when neutron was discovered people speculated about the existence of neutron stars. Chandrasekhar himself talked about black holes and so on and up to 70s people thought that these were only mathematical solutions. But immediately in the 70s because in the late 60s when quasars, pulsars, x-ray sources were discovered immediately the subject of relativistic astrophysics was born. And we know now today that these exotic objects like black holes uh, 
they are the engines of the most energetic explosions which are there in the universe. Einstein himself predicted the existence of gravitational waves which we can say are Einstein's messengers and as I will explain in my next uh, talk tomorrow, this is expected to open a new window to the universe and start out a new astronomy in the coming decades. As I said again, yet in spite of all this work for about a century, for about half a century, we still do not know how to put together quantum mechanics and general theory of relativity and therefore, the problem of quantum gravity is still a big open problem and if you look at the history of general theory of relativity or any of these particular theories, you realize that the limitation really is because even today we really do not have unambiguous inputs coming from observations or experiments. Only when you have inputs coming from observations or experiments, the degeneracy between the possible theories which exist can be sort of broken and it is the absence of that which really in one sense limits the progress in constructing a quantum theory of gravity. I will end by basically saying that general theory of relativity is characterized not only by mathematical elegance and conceptual depth, but it has had amazing observational success for almost 100 years. And over the years, the mathematical sophistication in problems in general theory of relativity is also increasing. Experiments are also becoming more sophisticated because technology is improving and precision measurement techniques are being brought into these per of experiments. And gravitational waves in some sense will transform this to and take it to the next stage and the nature of gravitational physics essentially now has changed. Einstein had a few collaborators, but if you look at a gravity wave experiment, it is like an experiment in the CERN where there are teams of hundred sorry a few thousands people working on the same kind of experiment. So, let me just end by a uh, basic statement uh, which he described his own discovery of the general theory of relativity. The years of anxious searching in the dark with their intense longing, their alterations of confidence and exhaustion and the final emergence into the light, only those who have experienced it can understand it. He also said a theory is the more impressive, the greater the simplicity of its premises the more different kinds of thing it relates and the more extended its area of applicability. Over the last hundred years, we have really seen all this really has really happened and as you know this particular story, somebody asked him when the e e eclipse experiment was successful, what would be your reaction if the experiment did not turn out to be what your theory predicted? Einstein is supposed to have said, I would be sorry for God. Thank you. So, now there are questions. Sir, as you said, uh, general theory of relativity is invariant under uh, special theory of relativity in lo uh, local frame of reference. Will you please explain what is local frame of reference and why is that? Yeah, suppose you take a uniform gravitational field as we assume, suppose you are on the earth and we are in a small region so that the uh, gravitational field can be constant. Okay. Then in that field you take a small elevator and cut its cable. Then what will happen? In that particular frame the gravitational field will not be there. So, it is almost as if you are in a frame of reference where there is no force, it is like an inertial frame. So, this frame transformed away is what is called as the local inertial frame. So, because it is like a frame like in special theory of relativity, the argument is that all laws of physics should really be the same in that particular frame and that is really the principle of equivalence that if I if you did an experiment in a true gravitational field which is uniform or, or, or let me say it the other way around. Suppose you did an experiment in free space where there is no gravitational field or you did this experiment in this elevator where the cable is cut, the result of that experiment will be the same. So, if you could not look out, 
you wouldn't know whether you are in free space or whether you are some friend of yours has cut the elevator cable. So this basically is the statement of the principle of equivalence which underlies the general theory of relativity. You said that uh, that is a uh, gravitational equation is um, an invariant under the local inertial frame. So uh, is it uh, not invariant under the global inertial frame? Yeah, so as I said, no. So you have to be careful. I mean, the statement which I made is because of the fact that you recover special relativity only in the uh, local frame, only in that particular uh, region, your special relativity transform, you know, uh, invariance will be sort of maintained. So the moment you go to a more arbitrary coordinate uh, transformation, the, th the theory would not have that in invariant. So your, uh, the laws which you discover in our lab based on special theory of relativity will be valid in the local inertial frame. And if you want to know how that law will transform or how that law will be in a more arbitrary gravitational field, you have to do something. You have to do some prescription to re replace local quantities in terms of global quantities. And you can write down how Maxwell's equation will look if it is replay, if you if it, you are in an arbitrary gravitational field. So one can do that particular prescription. So one should be very careful. One you know, one should uh, the invariance under special relativity is only in the local inertial frame. As you so said, the ratio of gravitational mass and inertial mass is yeah. constant for each body, right. everybody. So what does that physically interpret and how can you verify yeah. the experiment? So, you know, the, one should be, this is a statement about the universe we live in. What this is basically saying is that if you look at the way these two concepts appear in Newtonian theory, one comes in the second law of motion, one comes in the Newton's law of gravitation. So there is no reason why these two things should be the same. So suppose you keep track of these two quantities, say that whatever appears in, uh, uh, in law of gravitation is the gravitational mass, what appears in Newton's law of motion is inertial mass. Suppose you keep track of this and then try to do a simple experiment by taking your simple pendulum experiment and write down the equation of motion of the pendulum, period of the pendulum in terms of its length and acceleration to gravity. So you will find that this same famous formula which you have 2 pi root of L by G, in that particular formula what will appear will be the ratio of inertial mass to the gravitational mass. Just do the simple calculation. This is an experiment which Newton did. He created pendulums made up of different materials and saw that this ratio to the accuracy to which you can measure is a constant. So this is an experimental fact which Newton and which we can try to do with more sophistication with other experiments. So for example, you can do experiment which was done by E. H. Wash and then as I said in astronomy you can try to measure the ratio of this by looking at the motion of the moon and the earth in the field of the sun. So these basically tell, tell us that when you can make this measure this quantity very accurately an experimental fact is that they are a constant. So remember when I say they are a constant in, in physics it only means it is, it is 1 plus some error, right. So it is at the level of 10 raised to minus 13. If I measure this to the level of 10 raised to minus 20 whether this equivalence equality will remain or not I really do not know. So people are trying to set up more accurate experiments to measure this and this is one way in which we will know whether Einstein's theory of gravity is the final theory or in addition to the tensor field, there is some other field also which mediates gravitation. Regarding the perihelion of mercury, I was just thinking whether this is unique to mercury or you can have similar uh, shifting of this orbits in other, for other planets. Yes, in principle it should be there for all the planets, but because the mercury, you know, the gravity, remember this number is 43 seconds of arc in 100 years. So you really need the gravitational field to be very strong. So that is the reason we are using mercury because it is the closest so you can observe it more. But there are in astronomy more stronger gravitational fields. So for example, the object which I will talk about tomorrow, something called a binary pulsar where there are two neutron stars going around each other. There you can again measure the precession of the perihelion and then because the gravitational field is so much stronger that number will be very, very large.
it will not be 43 seconds per hour per century, but something which can be measured almost in a year. So, it has to happen in all, all theories. Let us thank Professor Ayer for this very beautiful talk. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, I request our Chairman PG Council, Professor Ranjan Burr, to kindly give a small memento on behalf of Utkal University on this occasion of 100 years of general theory of relativity as well as International Year of Light. Sir, please. Very good, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.